Good morning. Welcome to Monticello United Methodist Church. We're glad to have you here to worship with us this morning. So as we begin this service, have you ever had a time when, uh, when things were going so well, you, you just didn't want to leave? You, you were at a place or, um, where, where things seemed j just perfect? Uh, maybe it was the people you were with, but you didn't want to go back go back to what I call reality. Maybe it was the people you were with you didn't want to leave, or you were afraid of what you were going to go back to. So uh, as we begin the service, uh, listen to the prelude, what, what would it be like if you could just stay at that place? Please join me for our call to worship. Come, let us gather in the awareness of God's love. God's love has brought us to this place. It has made of us a church. We can live with confidence and hope in the assurance that we are forgiven and accepted by a power greater than ourselves. Because we are forgiven, we too can forgive. Let us praise this God of endless grace and offer our hearts true worship. Amen. Please stand as we join in our opening hymns.
Um, at this time, I want to welcome you to Monticello United Methodist Church. Welcome those who are listening on 107.7 and those who are watching our delayed broadcast. Uh, please turn and greet one another, and we ask the kids to come forward for the message for all ages. Well, good morning, friends. Good morning, good morning. So I have a question for you. Stella, I have a question for you. You ready? Have any of you ever been on a vacation before? A vacation. Yeah, where'd you go? Disney World? Yeah? Disneyland, yeah? Disney World? Also Disney World? No, okay. There's a lot of Disney up here. You guys ought to expand. What about like to the mountains or to the forest, to like the Grand Canyon, you know that stuff? We gotta expand our vacations, church. We gotta, we gotta figure that out. So when you were at Disney World or Disneyland or on vacation, did you have a lot of fun? Was it super magical? Was it awesome? You saw fireworks at Disney World? And you saw Anna and Elsa at Disney World? So it sounds like a really awesome vacation, right? Did you want to stay there forever? Yeah. Yeah? You guys want to stay at, the, at Disney World forever? You know, that's, that's really expensive. But, <laughs> but you didn't stay there forever, right? Why did you, why'd you come back? Because you can't be without a grown-up. Yes, Stella? <laughs> yeah. It's a long time because vacations are places we go for a little bit, but we can't stay there, right? Because if you guys are still in Disney World, you couldn't be going to school, right? You couldn't be here with your friends. You couldn't be at church. Wouldn't be able to worship God yet. Yes. Yes, thank you. And you, can, well, you can still pray in Disney World. That's, that's, that's portable. But yeah, you came back home. And you have to come back home when you go to these awesome places because you got work to do, right? Yeah. You guys have to go through all your classes. Give me a second, Elena. You have to go through all your classes. And you have to get smarter and get stronger and get bigger. You got to come back and play sports and, and come to church and worship God. You have other things you have to do. So though it's really awesome for us to go on these vacations, right, these super high mountaintop experiences where everything just seems so, so awesome, we still have to come back and do what we're supposed to do, right? We have to get back to, to doing what God has called us to do. And that's so the, the sermon about today is it's great to have those experiences that are really cool and really awesome. But we also have to make sure we, we come back and get down to business. All right, so let's, yes, Stella. That sounds pretty awesome. You guys pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, all these, these kids that are here, God, and all the awesome experiences they had and all the great things they've been able to do. But I thank you for, for them being here, not still in Disney World or still on vacation, but here with us so they can learn about you and your kingdom and how you've called us to be. God, I pray that you would allow them to learn to love as you've taught us to love. God, and so they can be the people you've called them to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, you're going to go to Adventures in Faith. And you all can stand up and sing another song.
You may be seated. Well, as we come to our prayer time today, I um, want to invite Pastor Justin to come up and, and share with you uh, something that's going to be happening, what, three weeks? Less than three weeks? Less than three weeks. Well, good morning. So in less than three weeks, I thought it'd be a great idea to take, uh, you know, about 20 high school students and some middle school students on a trip to Miami, Florida. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, we're doing a mission trip uh, to Miami, March 21st to the 28th. We are taking 21 kids, seven adults. That's a good ratio for us. We're happy with that. And we're going to be doing all kinds of work down there. Um, we're going to be clearing out a park so that kids can actually use that park again um, in an area that doesn't have a lot of green space. We're going to be boxing food for um, those in South Florida who don't have food. They get boxes of food from an organization called Feed Us South Florida. We're going to help out the church that I used to be a pastor at, um, do some demolition and some, uh, some landscaping, just helping them out because they don't have a lot of young people uh, to do that kind of work. And we're going to be helping out with the homeless uh, population there. They have a lot of things to go on with the homeless population, and we're going to be doing a lot of work with them to help ease some of that burden. So that trip is going to be March 21st to the 28th, and we've had a couple things come up um, that have made it a little more, a little more expensive. Um, and also, we're, we're trying to plan for some things that uh, may happen, could happen. So we're asking if you guys um, feel led to potentially give to the mission trip um, just to help cover some of those in incidentals, uh, one of them being the 15-passenger van we were going to rent um, died. So we had to, <laughs> we had to rent another 15-passenger van that was a little bit more expensive. So things like that, um, if you feel uh, led to give by the Holy Spirit, we really appreciate it, and we hope that you would pray with us March 21st to the 28th, as our students are going to, to make it in Miami as it is in heaven. Um, that is our, our slogan for this trip, and it's going to be a really great time. Okay. Thank you, Justin. There, there's an offering envelope if you want to help any time between now and, and the trip. I know that they would, would appreciate that. You know, I, we've done several mission trips so, over the years, but I'm really excited about this one, you know, particularly because of, of Justin's connection with that community before he, he moved to Indiana. I think it's going to be a, a great time of, of serving, a great uh, time of, of cross-cultural experience, and uh, it's uh, just going to be a time of, of learning and growing and, and being stretched in, in their faith as they go, and, and I know that uh, you'll want to, to support them any way you can. You know, as we come to our, our prayer time today, um, many of you are probably aware of the, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church that met in special session this past week. It's been a very painful time for the church. Um, you know, it's not a, an issue of, of winners and losers. I, you know, I don't think that there are any winners because at the end of the day, the church is divided. It's a, a very difficult season for the United Methodist Church. Um, you know, tonight at 7 o'clock, we're going to gather here in the sanctuary. We'll be listening to a, um, a message from the bishop, and, and I'll be sharing with you some of the, the things that, uh, that happened at General Conference or, or didn't happen at, at General Conference. Um, it's not a night of debate. It's just a, a night of, of coming together for, for information and, and uh, don't know that it, we fully know what it means for, for us as a congregation yet. But, um, but what I do know is that I believe that God's called us to be at the, this place. And so what we need to, to seek to, to do is uh, to, to continue to be the church that God's called us to be here in, in Monticello, Indiana. Also, it's a season in which we need to extend a lot of grace. Grace to, to one another, grace to other churches, grace to other pastors. You know, it was interesting this morning the, the number of, of messages that, that I got of, of pastors, um, you know, offering up their, their prayers, recognizing that uh, this morning was going to be difficult in, in every United Methodist Church. So I would ask you to, to pray for, for our church, pray for the denomination. If you want to know more about the details of the conference, you know, come tonight at 7 o'clock and we'll, we'll talk more about that. You know, as we prepare our hearts for prayer, would we'll draw your attention to the prayer window on the, the back of your bulletin. Also, uh, your connection card in, in your, your bulletin, uh, please take time to fill that out. And, and on the back, there's a, a place for prayer requests. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, if you just want the pastors to, to have that request, mark it confidential. If you want it in the prayer window for next week, you can mark it that. And all the, the prayer concerns, except those marked confidential, go out on the email prayer chain. 
So as we uh, prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, would invite you to join me in our call to prayer. Move me. <laughs> Lord, as we come before you in, in this day, we pray for the United Methodist Church, a church that is hurting, a church that is divided. And Lord, we know that um, the division does not come from you, but you call us to, to be united. And so, Lord, in the midst of the brokenness in our denomination, we, we pray for your grace. We pray for your grace and relationships. We pray for your grace between pastors, be, between churches. Lord, in, in our own church, we pray that your grace might, might abound in, in our relationships, that, that we might uh, continue to, to be the, the people that you've called us to be. Lord, help us to, to serve the, this community. Help us to, to be those who, who are your hands and feet. Help us to be those who, who reach out and in your love, to those who are hurting and, and struggling. Lord, for those in, in this day who are, are dealing with disappointment and, and heartache, those who are trying to, to do the right thing, to do the best thing, and, and yet they seem to, to face roadblocks and, and obstacles. Lord, I pray that you would continue to give them the, the perseverance to, uh, to move ahead. Lord, give them the, the patience that they need when when things don't turn out exactly the way they want or, or in the time that they want. Lord, in, the, in this day, for, for those who are, are concerned for loved ones, maybe those who are, are struggling with, with physical needs, those dealing with, with, um, with uh, mental or, or emotional illness, Lord, for those who are, are struggling to, to find their way forward, Lord, I pray that, um, that they might find your grace to be sufficient. Lord, bring those around them that will be encouragers, that will be helpers, that will be able to help them through this difficult time. Lord, we pray for our world, and, and particularly those who, who live in, in unsafe places, those who are faced with the, the threat of, of war, those who are are facing the threat of being displaced from their homes, those who are facing the, the, um, the threat and, and even the experience of, uh, of violence day by day. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come near to them and give them the strength and the courage that they need. Lord, I pray for those who are in unsafe places that, that they might find a, a place of, of escape, a, a place of refuge, a, a place of safety. Lord, we especially pray for the most vulnerable among us. We pray for, for children. We, we pray for those who are, are disabled. We pray that there would be those who, who would offer them a, a safe haven, would offer them a, a place to, to, to be safe in, in the midst of the, of the challenges that they face. Lord, Hear our prayers, for we pray this all in Jesus' name, and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Amen. Good morning. Scripture this morning comes from Matthew 17, 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, 
And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning we are, are starting a, a, a new series that we're calling Missing the Mark, uh, the Redemption of, of Peter. Uh, Liz, I'm, there's a, a slide that's behind the, the slide there. I don't know if you can, can get rid of that or not. If, if not, uh, the, um, anyway, we're, we're starting a, a new series call, called Missing the Mark. You know, Peter was one of the disciples that was, was closest to, to Jesus, and yet, uh, you know, it seemed that he didn't always quite get it. You know, Peter was one who um, Jesus said, you know, on Peter, he was the rock on which the church was going to be built. You know, when Jesus said that, I'm sure Peter must have felt pretty good about that. You know, wow, you know, I, God's going to use me for, for a special task here. And yet, um, and yet, even though Peter was going to be used in a special way by, by God in, in uh, building the church, you know, it, it was also a, an issue that, uh, that he didn't fully understand what that meant. You know, there, there were times when, when the best thing that, that Peter could have done was to be silent, but he felt like he had to say something, he, he had to do something, and, and, and when he did, it seemed that Peter often put his foot in his mouth and and it often uh, found out that, that he didn't quite get it all. In, in just three days, we're experiencing a day in the church year called Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is a, is a day that marks the beginning of the season of Lent. Lent uh, are the days uh, from Ash Wednesday that lead up to, to Easter. And, and during the, the season of Lent, it, it's a time in, in which we, we examine our, our hearts and lives. We ask ourselves the, the question is, is there any sin in my life? And if there is, you'll get rid of it. Is there something that God is calling me to do? Well, then do it. For some, there's a, a practice of, of giving something up for Lent. That practice of giving something up for Lent is not a, an issue of, um, of simply depriving yourself but it's a matter of depriving yourself for the purpose of, of growing in, in your spiritual walk and, and in your spiritual understanding and your relationship with Jesus. Like Peter, none of us have it all together. Like Peter, we don't fully understand what it is that Jesus taught and, and how it is that, that he wants us to live. Like Peter, we, we miss the mark. The good news is, though, that even in our failures, God is at work. God is bringing about redemption in our lives, just as God was at work bringing redemption and a fresh start in, in Peter's life as well. So let's turn to, to the scripture reading this morning that, that Jim ju just read for us. You know, even though the, the story is, was, was read to us from Matthew chapter 17, uh, we can find the, the same story, the story of the transfiguration being told in Mark chapter 7 and, and Luke chapter, no, Mark chapter 9 and Luke chapter 9. I'll be using uh, the, some references to, to those accounts as, as Mark and Luke share a few different details or, of, of this story. You know, this morning's passage begins by saying that after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain. Now, Luke tells us that they went up a high mountain to, to pray. You know, it was, was an issue that, uh, that they went up and, and Jesus was in, inviting them to, to pray together. And, and kind of like the, the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when the disciples were with Jesus there praying, you know, they got sleepy. 
you know, that seems to be a, a thing that, that happens uh, oftentimes when, uh, when people pray, they, they, may, get, they get, may get sleepy. Well, in, in Matthew chapter 16, you know, in the gospel story, um, you know, up until this point, Matthew has been focused on, on the ministry of Jesus. He's been focused on the, the, the birth, uh, and the call of the disciples, uh, some miracles, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, telling some, some parables. But in Matthew chapter 16, there's a, a switch. There, there's a, a, a shift in, in Matthew 16, 21. And, um, you know, I, I remember a, a class in seminary that uh, we were supposed to read the, the book of Matthew and, and we were supposed to, to look at the, the various segments of, of, of how, the, how the story flowed. Well, I could never figure out when, where the shift was that the professor told us that we should find, but, but when he pointed it out to me, it, it became obvious. And, and that shift was in, in Matthew 16, 21, when, um, when it's an issue that, that, that Jesus talks about, you know, turning his face and heading toward Jerusalem. In, in chapter 16, you know, there, there's a, a switch that, that happens. Jesus wrote from, from that, or Matthew wrote, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day and be raised to, to life. You know, life with Jesus had been pretty easy up to, to this point. But now Jesus began telling his disciples about what was coming. He began telling them that, that he was going to suffer. He began telling them that, that he was going to be put to death and that on the third day he was, was going to be raised from, from the dead. You know, he, up until this point, uh, hanging out with Jesus was, was pretty cool, was pretty easy. It was an issue that uh, they thought that um, you know, maybe Jesus was going to have an earthly kingdom, and with that earthly kingdom, you know, his inner circle would be a part of his, uh, his administration. They, they would be a, a part of you know, kind of being the, uh, the right-hand men for, for Jesus. But, uh, but something's beginning to change now. Because Jesus said that he's going to suffer, that he's going to die, that, that there's going to be a, a resurrection. And, and, and it's a bit hard for the disciples to comprehend and, and embrace. At the very end of chapter 16, Jesus told them that some of them standing there would not experience death until they saw the Son of God coming to his kingdom. So that's how chapter 16 ends. And then it says, then six days later. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain to pray, and they were, were on the mountain. You know, as they were on the mountain, Jesus was transfigured before them. Uh, the Greek word that, that's translated as, as uh, transfigured is metaphu. You know, it, it um, you know, is related to a word that we get, metamorphosis. Talks about a change, talks about a transition, you know, um, uh, a caterpillar goes through a, a metamorphosis. The, the caterpillar be, becomes a butterfly. So it is that uh, with this transfigures, transfiguration, there's a metamorphosis that Jesus moves from, from an earthly body to, to taking on a, a, a heavenly body. And, and the disciples who are, are with him see this, this transformation. Uh, it says that... Um, that as Jesus appeared, his face shone like the sun, and, and his clothes became as white as the light. And as Jesus was transfigured into to some sort of heavenly being, there, there were also two other people that, that appeared with him. Those other two people that, that appeared uh, were, were Moses and, and, and Elijah. Uh, Jesus had said six days earlier that, that some of the disciples would not die before they, they experienced his heavenly kingdom. Well, I've always thought about the, the, um, the story of the transfiguration being a story about something for, for the disciples, something that the disciples needed. And, and there was something in, in this that the, the disciples needed, but, 
But as I've been preparing today, I, I realized that there were also some things in, in this story in which Jesus needed. You know, it gave Jesus strength and comfort as he turned his face toward Jerusalem in order to, to face the cross. Jesus had already experienced the glory of heaven because he was with the heavenly Father from the beginning, but he had left heaven to, to, to come to earth. And he is reminded of the glory of heaven. He, he experienced the, the foretaste of, of the glory that he was going to be returning to after the, the resurrection. You know, Jesus had, had um, already experienced glory, but, but it was a reminder, as a foretaste of the glory that was coming. The second source of comfort that Jesus experienced on, on the, the mountain was, was the, the assurance that the mystery of the cross was understood by, by some of the saints that had, had gone on b before him. You know, and those saints, Moses and Elijah, they encouraged him. You know, the story tells us that, um, that Jesus talked with Moses and Elijah. We, we don't know exactly what it is that they talked about. But I have a feeling that they were talking about you know, the purpose that Jesus had gone to, to earth to, to fulfill. They were talking about the, the crucifixion and the resurrection that was coming up. It was an issue that, uh, that Moses and Elijah were, were encouraging Jesus because he was about to enter into the phase of, of his earthly ministry that was going to be tougher than, than any season he, he had experienced up until that point. The third source of, of comfort for Jesus was the voice of his heavenly father saying, this is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. You know, I might compare this transfiguration for, for Jesus to be something like a, a, a halftime in the locker room for, for coaches with their, with their players. You know, and in the locker room, a coach will, will review the game plan. You know, they'll, they'll talk about how things have gone up until this point, and they'll also talk about the, the plan of what's, what's yet to come and, and encourage them to, uh, to, to hang in there, to, to encourage them that, you know, you can do this, and, and you know, we can, we can come out victorious. I, I kind of think that as Jesus talked with Moses and, and Elijah and, and as, as he heard the voice of the Heavenly Father, it was that type of encouragement for, for Jesus that, yes, this is why you came, and yes, it's going to be tough, but, but you can do this. And knowing that his Heavenly Father was pleased with him must have been a, must have been a, a, a big boost, a, a big motivator for him. So now let's move to, to the disciples. What did the transfiguration do for the disciples? Well, Mark and, and Luke indicate that um, as Jesus was, was transfigured with Moses and, and the appearance of Moses and Elijah, he didn't know what to say. And so Peter didn't know what to say, so he just blurted that out and he said, well, why don't we just stay here? You know, why don't we build three tents? Why don't we build three shelters? One for you, Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and, and we'll, we'll just stay here. You know, it could be that, um, you know, Peter didn't get what Jesus had told him six days earlier. You know, six days earlier, uh, he had told them that he was going to suffer, that he was going to be arrested and, and crucified he told them it wasn't going to be easy. It, it wasn't going to be pleasant. And, and maybe Peter thought that, okay, if we just stay here on the mountain, if we stay in, in this place, then Jesus won't have to go through that. You know, we won't have to experience the, the suffering. We won't have to experience the uncertainty of what the, the, uh, the days ahead are, are going to hold. Or, or maybe Peter, Peter was experiencing a mountaintop experience, and he didn't want to come off that mountain. You know, have you ever been to a maybe a church camp or some sort of a, a spiritual retreat, and you just say, oh, I don't want to go home. I just want to stay here. I, I want to continue to live in this environment. I want to continue to, to live in, in this experience. And so maybe that was what was with Peter. It's like, oh, we just want to stay in, in this moment. We, we want to experience the, the, uh, what, what we have up here on the mountaintop. We want to live on the mountain but we don't want to go back to our, our daily routine. We don't want things to change. But the purpose of the mountaintop experience, 
The purpose of the mountaintop experience for the disciples was to help them, to, to strengthen their faith for what it was that they were going to be experiencing in the weeks and months and even years ahead. When Jesus came down off the mountain with his, his disciples, he told them, don't tell anyone what it is that you've experienced on this mountain until the Son of Man has been resurrected from the dead. Why do you think that is? You know, Peter, James, and John, they could have gone down and, and told everyone the story of what it was that they experienced on, on the mountaintop. But at that point, they would have only been sharing out of their excitement and, and their enthusiasm. But Jesus knew that they were going to need this experience so that when he was resurrected, they could remember you know, what they had experienced on the mountaintop. They could, experience, they could remember what it was that Jesus had told them as they were trying to figure out how they, they go on after Jesus' death and, and resurrection. This particular experience would be a motivator for them, and especially as they remember the words of the Heavenly Father coming out of the clouds saying, this is my son whom I love. This is my son who I am well pleased. You know, do what he tells you to do. The transfiguration experience gave the disciples something that they were going to need for future struggles and, and challenges. Right now, I feel like um, the United Methodist Church as a denomination is, is kind of like Peter. We've, we've missed the mark. And I'm not... Uh, making that statement based upon decisions that were made at, at General Conference, but I'm making that based upon the, the, the fact that we're divided. And in that, that div division, I believe that, that we've missed the mark. As I believe we've missed the mark, there's also hope. Because despite Peter missing the mark, Peter experienced redemption. Despite Peter missing the mark, he had a a new start and a, a fresh start. I don't know what things are going to look like for the United Methodist denomination. I don't know what it, what's going to, to be coming down, down the road. My prediction that uh, whatever that fresh start looks like, whatever that new thing looks like for, for the denomination, it's going to be difficult for us to get there. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be painful and, and it will come with some struggle. But as the denomination struggles, I want to encourage us as, as a congregation to, to be the body of Christ here at the, the Monticello United Methodist Church. You know, we have a calling. We, we have a, a, a calling and, and a place of, of ministry in, in our community. And as the chaos may be happening on a national or, or even on an international level, I believe that we need to keep in focus who it is that God has called us to be. And he's called us to, to create welcoming environments in this place where all can, can connect to God, grow in Christ, and, and love one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that uh, we shouldn't concern ourselves with the, the speck of dust in someone else's eye, but we needed to be more concerned about the, the plank in our own eye. In our own eye. My prediction is that change is, is not going to come about in, in the denomination by shaming or guilting anyone into change. So it's only going to come through the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit changing hearts and, and lives. At one point in, in the conference this week, there was a point at which they were coming up to a vote and, and there, there was a bishop that was, was praying for for the, the general conference but before that vote. And uh, as she prayed, she prayed, oh God, may our will be done. No, Lord, I mean your will, your will, not our will. Now, maybe it was an honest mistake. Maybe it was a Freudian slip. But I believe that it's something that's very important for us to hear. As we pray going forward, not praying, oh Lord, may my will be done. But may your will be done. May your will be done in, in my heart and, and life. You know, that uh, song that, that goes with uh, the, the Lenten season, it's me, it's, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. 
Not, not pointing the, the finger or condemning or, or ridiculing others. During this Lenten season, maybe you, you should, should give something up for, in order to invest in a, in a spiritual practice. You know, maybe, um, maybe for some it's an issue of giving up social media. Giving up social media for the season of Lent or maybe fasting from social media one day a, a week, you know, taking a, a Sabbath from, from, um, from social media. Maybe it's an issue that, um, you know, there are other types of, of electronics, maybe TV and, and radio, ways, things that you give up for the purpose of seeking to hear the Holy Spirit's voice and, and leading in your life. Maybe it's a, an issue that... Uh, you turn off your phones when you, you sit down to, together at a meal. So you're focusing on, on the people at the table with you and, and not being distracted by those who, who may be wanting to get your attention when, when you need to be focusing on others around the table. You know, maybe if you don't have a practice of, of, of sitting down and eating a meal together as a family, maybe you, um, maybe you make it a goal to, to do that once a week and and to, to focus on conversation around the table. Well, once a day would be better, but if you don't do it at all, one, once a week is, is, um, is a good start. You know, maybe it's making an intentional effort during this, this season of Lent to follow Wesley's three simple rules. Three simple rules of, of do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. I want you to notice one more thing in this passage this morning. When Peter, James, and John heard the voice of, of, um, of, of God the Father coming out of the, the cloud and saying, this is my son who I love, who I'm well pleased, listen to him, it says that they fell on, on their faces and, and were terrified. And in the midst of their, their fear, in the midst of, of their uncertainty, Jesus came and tapped them on the shoulder and he said, get up, don't be afraid. We're facing uncertain days as a denomination, as a culture, as a nation, even as a world. We can get ourselves all worked up. We, we can become anxious. We can begin attacking others. But Jesus says to us, get up. Don't be afraid. Come back down the mountain, and we're going to get through this together. Let us pray. Lord, as we face challenging days, help us to not to seek to, to do that by ourselves, but help us to do, get through those difficult days through, through union with your Holy Spirit and, and also in union and communion and communication with other brothers and sisters in the faith. Lord, during this, this season of Lent, May it be a time where each of us grow in, in our sensitivity to, to hearing the prompting of your Holy Spirit and to respond as your Spirit leads. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. This morning we're going to, to share in the, the sacrament of Holy Communion together. And in the, the United Methodist Church, we have uh, a practice of open communion, which means that anyone who wishes to respond to, to the invitation to come to the Lord's table is invited to do so. And that invitation is to all who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and seek to live in love and charity with your neighbor. If that's the desire of your heart, then, then you're invited to, to come to the Lord's table. Today, we're going to be receiving the, the elements in, in the pews, in just a few moments, the, the bread will be passed, and, and then, um, and then the, the grape juice will be passed. Just uh, in case it's a concern for you, the, the bread that will be passed is gluten-free. Um, and so if that's a concern, just know that, uh, that the, the bread is gluten-free today. As we come to the Lord's table, it's important for us to examine our own hearts and lives. And so in these moments of silence, I would invite you to confess your sin 
to confess your own need before our Father in heaven. Father, forgive us for those times and in those ways when we fail to act as your children. Father, forgive us for those times and those ways in which our actions bring division. Father, forgive us for those times and those ways in which we don't act as the children that you've called us to be. Father, forgive us. And during this season of Lent, may you shape us and mold us more into the image of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And also after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, as often as you break this bread and drink from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And now, O oh Lord, we pray that you would send down your blessing upon these these symbols of bread and grape juice, may they become for us the body and blood of Jesus. And in turn, may we be his hands and feet. May we be his witnesses. May we be his disciples in the world in which we live. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. This time we would invite the ushers to come forward and, and to serve.
Well, our memory verse to this week comes from uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 7. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, and don't be afraid. Whatever it is that you may be facing, whatever challenge it is that you may be facing, I would encourage you to hold on to, to that promise. Get up and don't be afraid because Jesus is walking with you. you know, in the way of next steps uh, this week, um, the, the first one is just, I will. I don't know how you might fill in that blank. You know, maybe there's something that, um, that you sense the, the Holy Spirit leading you to do during the season of Lent. So I will, you know, whatever it is that, that you feel led to, to do during Lent. Maybe this morning as you've been sitting here, the, the Holy Spirit has been stirring in your heart that there's something that, that you, you need to do. Well, you know, rather than just go out the door and forget about it, you know, to, to uh, say, okay, I will and whatever that is. And, and maybe uh, one of the tests that you can give to, to determine is it really the Holy Spirit that's leading me is, is um, you know, how you're being led. Is it, is it an issue of doing good? Is it an issue of doing no harm? Uh, and is it a, an issue that uh, is helping you to, to stay in love with God? Maybe there's something that, um, that God's been dealing with you for some time that, that you've been, uh, been kind of resisting or, or hesitant on. And maybe this morning at the beginning of Lent, you say, okay, I, I will, whatever it is that, that God's been challenging you or, or leading you to, to do. And then uh, another next step would just invite you to, to pray for this congregation and for, for the United Methodist Church as we find our, our way forward following the actions of General Conference. If you are a first-time guest with us today, we're excited to have you, excited that you decided to join us this morning. And uh, I want to encourage everyone to fill out their connection card if you haven't already. And uh, when the offering plate passes by, make sure you put that connection card in there. And if this is your first time with us, we have a gift for you. So make sure you stop at the Welcome Center at the banner of Starting Point to pick up your gift. Let's pray for our offering. Holy God, thank you for all that you've given us, all the ways you've blessed us, even allowing hard things to come into our lives so that we may grow and, and cling all the more to you. At this time, we give back to you a portion of what you have given to us to use it to further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers come and pass the offering, I want to just announce a few things. Friendship Connection for potty trained three-year-olds through fifth grade is this evening from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Revolution, our junior high group, meets from 5 to 6.30 as well. And our high school group will meet at 6.48 to 9 p.m. this evening. The UMCOR dinner for Friendship Connection will be held March 17th, and we will be collecting money for that project next Sunday. UMCOR stands for United Methodist Committee on Relief. Mumsy shirts are in, so you can uh, pick yours up on the way out today. As Pastor Brian said, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. There will be a youth Ash Wednesday service, 7 a.m. up in the loft, and then there will be a 7 p.m. Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary for all. So also in your bulletin um, where you can check for other events and announcements, there is an announcement about, um, about district meetings and there was a time change on the one at Remington. It is at 7 p.m. It's been a wonderful morning here together. Let's stand and uh, join in singing our last hymn.
And now as you go forth from this place, whatever you may face in this coming week, do not be afraid because Jesus is walking with you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.